and sing with us. can be seated. Please join us in praying for the offering. Lord, we thank you that you're a generous God with us, with your mercy, with your gifts, with your presence. You're so generous. We pray that you would make our hearts generous and cheerful 
as we give to you what you've given to us. May you use it for your kingdom's glory and growth, and may you use um, our act of faith and giving to transform us more into the image of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand, we'll sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father. seated. Well, good morning, church, and happy Advent season. Uh, it can be a difficult time, but in the middle of that, uh, it can also be a, a joyful time when we remember why it is that Christ came, how much of a difference that made, uh, getting to focus on that and reflect on that together as a church family. So I'm thankful to get to do that with you guys and um, to worship the Lord together this morning. I uh, just wanted to remind you of a couple of things. We're continuing to encourage you guys to take some next steps with outreach. Um, we've had outreach events this year, uh, whether it was our fall festival or a game night or the open mic night or whatever it was, and we would love for all of us to be the follow-up, all of us to be the outreach team. And just invite someone that you got to meet there to come hang out, get coffee, have dinner, uh, just someone you know. Um, we're continuing to just encourage us all to do that. I know the holiday season can be busy, but if, just to get in that mindset and do that, if we can all be trying to um, you know, be witnesses for those around us, be friends, be um, people who can share the love of Jesus, uh, we're going to just see the most amazing outreach event that we ever could. So I uh, just want to encourage you to be thinking about that as uh, families and individuals and have that on your radars. Um, Wanted to let you know as well what we have planned for Christmas Eve and Christmas since Christmas is on a Sunday this year. Uh, every church is doing things just a little bit different. So we are going to have a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be at 4 p.m. And we're very excited. You heard uh, Alex give some thanks from Out, Up and Out Ministry. They're going to be joining us for Christmas Eve and helping us with music. And so be looking forward to that. We're going to have a shorter service uh, from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it's going to be kid-friendly. We're going to have the um, the Silent Night Candle Ceremony as well. Uh, on Christmas Day, we unfortunately um, aren't able to have a normal gathering, but we will be handing out devotional materials for you and your families on a Christmas Eve. And we're also encouraging you to um, check out Exmoor Baptist Church on Sunday morning to go to a gathering there. They have a service at 11 a.m. And they have welcomed everybody in Eastville Baptist to join them as well. So that's kind of what we have coming up as we get closer and closer to Christmas. Just want to continue to remind you guys so you can put it on your calendars and be aware of what we have coming up. Um, but also for today, you may have noticed uh, the decorating team has already gotten a head start on doing some Christmas decorating for us for the Advent season, the poinsettias, the tree. But uh, we're going to take a few minutes after the service if we can all just help out and put some ornaments up, uh, have some Christmas joy together. If you can stick around, we would love to... Uh, do that together. So if you have some time, please join us after the, the gathering to, to um, decorate for Christmas a little bit here in the church together. But uh, as, right now, as we're continuing to um, move forward together in this Advent season and to, to wait on Christ, to put ourselves in the shoes of those who waited for Him and, and to um, trust in Him for our own futures, Another way that we practice that is with the, the, our Advent readings and the Advent candle. So I've asked uh, Frank to come on up and help us with this morning's um, Advent reading and candle. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. This is the song of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. At first, Zechariah did not believe God could give his family a child. But after his son was born, Luke 1, 67 says, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He has dealt mercifully with our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant that we, having been rescued from the hand of our enemies, would serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And you, child, would be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us, to shine on those who live in darkness and the, sh and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Today we light the second Advent candle, the candle of faith, as we prepare for our hearts and minds for the coming of the Messiah. Thank you, Frankie. With the Advent candles and these readings, we continue to count down the days to Christmas. Everybody loves a good Christmas countdown. And I uh, want to invite the kids to go on back at this time as well for the, the kids' lessons and the volunteers who are helping them with that this morning too. Thank you so much for counting down the days to Christmas with them and being a part of our church family all together. Yeah, everybody loves a good Christmas countdown, right? The decorators love them, the TV shows love them, the Christmas movie marathons, counting down the days. Even the Christmas songs that we hear on the radio, they sing about all that we want for Christmas, right? They sing about dreaming of a snowy white Christmas, the faithful friends who are dear to us, who will be near to us once more. It's, it's sort of built into the DNA of the Christmas season to be waiting for something, to be waiting for someone, to be waiting for some experience, counting down the days with anticipation, rejoicing when the day finally comes. But not all waiting is created equal. There was a way that those shepherds and wise men and Mary and Joseph waited that was very different from the way that Ralphie waited for his Red Rider BB gun. There is a way of waiting that somehow makes us more obsessed with immediate gratification. And there's a way of waiting that moves us past it to a greater hope. This Advent season, we hear from the songs of waiting in the Psalms. This Advent season, we build our hope in the same Messiah who captive Israel waited on. We use the same thing that they use to do that. We use the Psalms. The Psalms give us words. They give us patterns, places to go to do that, to wait on the Lord. They show us how to do that. The more that we pray these prayers, the more we will understand how much of a difference it makes when Jesus arrives on the scene. The more that we wait on the Lord, the way that these Psalms show us how, the more we will hope in Christ for our own futures. The last week we kicked off the Advent series and we prayed the prayer of Psalm 33. We sang its song, so to speak. We experienced how to wait with disappointments while the human hopes tempt us and fail us. We heard and experienced what it's like to 
wait on the Lord instead. But today we pray the prayer of Psalm 37. We sing its song. We experience what it's like to wait while the rest of the world isn't waiting and seems to be better off. Today we experience a lonely, frustrated kind of waiting that is no longer lonely or frustrated by the end of it. It's a longer psalm than we had last week. It's on page 490 of the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow along in those. Page 490. But I'd like to read the whole thing straight through for us to start so that we can get the full experience. The power of God's word comes straight from the source, after all, not from my own words. So don't think of this reading as just the springboard or the the subject matter for the sermon. What you hear Psalm 37 declare, declare in your own soul. What you watch Psalm 37 observe, observe for yourself. What you feel Psalm 37 feel, feel it in connection with your own life. Make it your song as you hear it. This is Psalm 37. A Psalm of David. Do not be agitated. Do not anger yourself by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong, for they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. He will answer your prayers. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated. Do not anger yourself by the one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger. Give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm, for evildoers will be destroyed. But those who put their hope in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will enjoy abundant prosperity. The wicked person schemes against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. The Lord laughs at him because he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the bow, drawn the sword, and strung the bow to bring down the poor and needy and to slaughter those whose way is upright. Their sword will enter their own hearts and their bows will be broken. The little that the righteous has is better than the abundance of many wicked people. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord supports the righteous. The Lord watches over the blameless all their days, and their inheritance will last forever. They will not be disgraced in times of adversity. They will be satisfied in days of hunger. But the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies, like the glory of the pastures, will fade away. They will fade away like smoke. The wicked person borrows and does not repay, but the righteous one is gracious and giving. Those who are blessed by the Lord will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be destroyed. A person's steps are established by the Lord, and he takes pleasure in his way. Though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed, because the Lord supports him with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. He is always generous, always lending, and his children are a blessing. Turn away from evil, do what is good, and settle permanently, for the Lord loves justice and will not abandon his faithful ones. They are kept safe forever, but the children of the wicked will be destroyed. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it permanently. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue speaks what is just. The instruction of his God is in his heart. His steps do not falter. The wicked one lies in wait for the righteous and intends to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in the power of the wicked one or allow him to 
be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will watch when the wicked are destroyed. I have seen a wicked, violent person, well-rooted like a flourishing native tree. Then I passed by and noticed he was gone. I searched for him, but he could not be found. Watch the blameless, observe the upright, for a person of peace will have a future. The transgressors will all be eliminated. The future of the wicked will be destroyed. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord, their refuge in a time of distress. The Lord helps and delivers them. He will deliver them from the wicked and will save them because they take refuge in him. Let's pray. Lord, we wait on you this morning. Lord, help us not to anger ourselves at all the evil that seems to prosper while we seem not to. Lord, help us to take delight in you, wait on you patiently and expectantly, that you are fill our Christmases with that. Fill it with the meaning it was meant to have. Help us to understand what it's like to wait for a Messiah. Help us to understand how much a difference he makes. Help us to wait on you even now as we follow him. It's only by your grace that we can pray that and be here and be united to Christ. And it's all in his name that we pray. Amen. How do you wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's? How do you wait on the Lord when those who don't seem to have a better success rate than you? Those questions might really hit home for you. They might sting a little bit with how personal they are. Or it might just seem like an interesting thought experiment or somewhere in between. But no matter where we come from with this, the more that we wait on the Lord the way Psalm 37 does, the more meaningful Christmas is going to be for us this year. Psalm 37 has a different flavor than a lot of the other psalms. Uh, It's what we call a wisdom psalm. In fact, one guy, uh, Jeffrey Grogan, he said, you could have pulled this psalm straight out of the book of Proverbs. Kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? But if this psalm was just a collection of Proverbs, then we would have actually found it in the book of Proverbs. This is meant for us as a psalm, as a prayer. It's a song of waiting. This is a psalm that calls on us not to anger ourselves while we look out at the success of the wicked, but to choose to wait on the Lord instead. Do not fret when the wicked person seems to succeed, the psalm begins. Don't envy those who do wrong. Take delight in the Lord. Commit your way to Him. Be silent before the Lord. Wait patiently. Wait confidently. Wait expectantly for him. Don't be agitated by the one who prospers in his way. Verse 7. The rest of the verses that we get, the the proverb-sounding wisdom that we preach to ourselves in this prayer, it's like the fuel that keeps that fire going that we started with. The wicked person schemes against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Verse 12. But the Lord laughs at him. Because he sees that his day is coming. The little that the righteous person has is better than the abundance of many wicked people, verse 16. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord supports the righteous. The arm was a symbol of power and strength. This psalm of waiting is not just tapping into our brains. It's tapping into our our gut level, emotional responses to the successes of the people around us. In fact, you can't see it in the English, but one of the beautiful parts of this poem is that it's an acrostic, meaning every two verses starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet from A to Z. That's why in your pew Bible you see those extra spaces in between the sets of two verses. There's a new letter, the next letter that starts off each one. 
there are only eight or so of the 150 psalms that are like that, that do that. And usually the acrostic adds to the feeling of completeness in some way. Like Psalm 145, praising the Lord from A to Z, right? Or Psalm 119, like the A to Z perfection of God's word. So why use an A to Z acrostic in a, in a psalm like this one? Well, could it be that there is a completeness, there's a, there's a dependableness to the future that God secures, unlike the, the passing limelight of the wicked? Could it be that we feel that as we preach this poetry to ourselves, as everything gets rearranged back in its proper order from A down to Z? The NET translation has a note that puts it this way. It says, when the, when the smoke of judgment clears, the wicked will be gone, but the godly will remain and inherit God's promised blessings. Now, saying that is one thing planting our feet on the other side of that when the smoke clears is another thing. And that's what this psalm does in us as we read through it, as we pray it from A to Z. We call on ourselves to delight in the Lord while the wicked seem to prosper. And then we remind ourselves of why we can do that with all that wisdom in there. And then we come back full circle in the end with another Wait on the Lord as that fire has grown to its peak. We're like the fishermen sitting out there on the boat while all the newbies are randomly casting their nets and catching boatloads and filling, filling their loads and ours is empty. And we get frustrated and we get lonely. We get exhausted until we come off the waters for a while. We refresh ourselves on the hydrographic maps, the weather patterns, and we remind ourselves that we are in the right spot. Wait for the Lord, we come back to in verse 34. He will exalt you to inherit the land. You will watch when the limelight of those who flourish in wrongdoing fades away. Wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's because their success won't last but his will. This is not a psalm that's meant to puff you up in pride or to prove to everyone else that you will get the last laugh because you're so much better. The good news of Jesus and his grace that we need is not canceled out by any of this because it is the Lord who we are waiting on to save us, to change our fates. It is Christ who does that. It is Christ who provides us with his righteousness that we depend on. But as you bank on that good news, how do you wait on the Lord? How do you wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's? How do you wait on the Lord when those who don't have a better success rate? You remind yourself that the most dazzling flower of the field, no matter how impressive it looks, quickly fades. You remind yourself how much happier the thief is when he first gets the stolen goods than when it all catches up to him and he's caught. You pray and you declare to yourself that it's not the wicked who will inherit the land or possess the earth it is those who wait on the Lord. That punchline, who will in fact inherit the earth, is what this psalm of waiting keeps landing on all throughout its verses. It's like the refrain in this song that it keeps coming back to five different times. Those who put their hope in the Lord, literally those who are Lord waiters, will inherit the land, verse 9. The humble will inherit the land, or the meek will inherit the earth, we could translate, verse 11. Those blessed by the Lord will inherit the land, verse 22. The righteous will inherit the land, verse 29. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. 
Now, the Israelites had special promises when it came to their homeland, didn't they? So we might be tempted to say, oh, well, you know, this psalm is definitely, it's powerful, but the big motivating refrain, that inherit the land thing, that's kind of irrelevant for me. Right? But if that were really true, then why would the Lord Jesus teach all his disciples in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the humble, blessed are the meek, why? For they will inherit the earth. They will inherit the land. Where do you think he got that from? Jesus teaches his disciples this psalm, saying it's not just the Israelites who could bank on this psalm knowing that God's promises for their homeland could be counted on. It's not just that. It's that the meek, the poor in the Lord everywhere are more blessed than those who throw their weight around and fret over their own triumphs. It's that the ones who wait on the Lord and His Messiah and His kingdom will inherit that kingdom. It's that there's a reversal of present fortunes because present fortunes are not the most important thing to focus on. Blessed are the meek, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, for they will inherit the earth. And as He said that, He was not just creating a new, different way of hoping in the Lord, so advanced beyond Old Testament stuff. No, he was echoing Psalm 37 vividly and what it declares five times over. Wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's because no one else but the Lord can outlast their trouble. Wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's because their success won't last but his will. Think of the Advent season and all that it's meant to point us back to, all that it's meant to remind us of, all that it's meant to point us forward to. Think of those Israelites, those wise men, those people waiting on the Lord to bring forward His Messiah for hundreds, for thousands of years. It wasn't just that the Israelites got disappointed seeing all the human resources and hopes that didn't pan out for them. It was that the ungodly alternative seemed to work while their own approach didn't. The ruthlessness of the Romans, the success of the pantheon (laughs) religious sellouts, it all seemed to make life work much better for them than their own prayers were doing. And we're not just talking about a few months of unemployment here either. We're talking about centuries of oppression and instability, and desperation. Real life stuff, not made up Christmas movies. This was the world that Jesus entered into. This is what the world was like. This is what the people in Bethlehem and Jerusalem were facing while they waited for a Messiah. They couldn't just go to their nine to fives and pretend like it would all just sort itself out. The threats, the the, the people who caved around them, the the tax collectors who turned on them and stole from them. I mean, they seemed to be prospering while seeking the Lord was not. Can you feel what that was like with this psalm? Can you put yourself into the scene that Christmas plays into with this psalm of waiting? What were you supposed to do as Joseph or as one of the mothers in Bethlehem whose child Herod had massacred, as Zechariah and Elizabeth watching around you and seeing the opposite of what you're called to in Scripture flourishing while you struggle and suffer. Can you understand how gut-wrenching but how necessary it was to pray Psalm 37, to wait like this, to wait on the Lord when it felt like no one else was, knowing their success would not last but His would. Can you imagine how much more powerful Christmas Day is when you wait for it like that as the answer to this? When Jesus is not just a lifeless wood carving of a baby in a manger, but the one who reverses the fortunes of the meek and the wicked to give them their inheritance. 
as someone who follows that same Messiah today, this psalm didn't stop being relevant for you after he arrived. Christ taught us this psalm to us, to his disciples. We still wait on the, word, the Lord like this. We still hope in him while the rest of the world doesn't. We start out that prayer lonely because waiting on the Lord often isolates us. The default, friends, is for us not to be the majority. And the majority often rejects the hope that we bank on. So we, we feel stranded. We feel left out. Like the world is so much more successful in the things that we reject than we are by trusting Jesus. But we end that prayer with an expanded vision of who our community really is. Who is really with us and watches over us. Of what the, the culture, the people that really inherit the earth after the smoke has cleared and the limelight has passed them. Who that really is. What we're really a part of. We start out the psalm frustrated. Frustrated every time we come back to it. Because what shouldn't be working is working. The ones who shouldn't be prospering are prospering. The ones who seek the Lord and His justice and His love, who want to follow Jesus, they're losing, they're trampled on. They're dismissed. We start out frustrated, but we end the psalm sure and satisfied, established by the Lord, confident in the long-term success of God's intervention. How do we get from there to here? How do we start with lonely, frustrated, waiting, and end sure and satisfied? We call on the Lord. We take delight in Him. We call on ourselves not to anger ourselves while the wicked seem to prosper. We remind ourselves in that middle section why we can do that with all the wisdom that's in there. And we come back full circle in the end with another wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. What are the news stories? Who are the people? What are the trends? that seem to be blossoming despite their rejection of God's word or because of it? What are the doubts? What are the frustrations? The loneliness that comes for you when you compare yourself to non-Christians or when you compare yourself to those who are unashamedly immoral people? Wait on the Lord when it feels like no one else's. Because their success won't last. But His will. His will. Let this psalm help you practice that. Let this psalm help you understand Christmas. Let this psalm help you wait on your Messiah. There's so many different ways that we wait. Last week with Psalm 33, when we're disappointed, when the human hopes let us down, we wait on the Lord, but this week in the frustrated, in the lonely waiting when we're looking out at those around us, we wait on the Lord. We know that their success is short-lived, but the Lord's is not. So we wait on Him. Let's pray and do that now. Heavenly Father, we wait on You this Advent. We, we trust in You when we're frustrated, when we're lonely, when we Look out at those around us and see what shouldn't be working, working. Lord, we know that you are so much bigger than the immediate gratification. You're so much wiser and more powerful than what seems to be happening right now. And we know that our future is secure in your hands. We know that after the smoke clears, that we stand secure in you, not because of how much better we are or puffed up we are, because of what you've done to save us as we wait on you and trust in you and depend on Christ. Lord, help this Christmas season to mean more for us than it did last year as we take up these songs of waiting as our own, as we 
live the Psalms in our lives and in our prayers. And we come back to you and hope in you, knowing your justice, your restoration, what you will do is something that we can bake on. Lord, please do that work in us this season by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During the Advent season, we have the chance to reflect and to hope in the coming of Jesus. So this morning, in the middle of that Advent season, we have the chance to reflect on what it is Jesus really came to do. During the Advent season, we rehearse and we remind ourselves what it's like to wait on the Lord, why that's important. But this morning, with communion, we have the chance to rehearse and to remind ourselves why we can wait on Him so confidently, how we can put our hope in Him. This morning, we take communion together like Jesus commanded, and we eat the bread. And we pray and we think about the body of Jesus which was broken to make us whole. As we drink the cup, we pray and we think about the blood of Jesus which was poured out as a sacrifice for our sin. Jesus received the penalty that we deserve so that we could be forgiven. He rose from the dead to give us life. And we take communion together because Jesus has brought us together. He has broken down the sins that divide us. So you don't have to be a member here to take communion with us. The only thing we ask is just what the Bible asks, that you be a follower of Christ. If that's not you, you're always welcome here. We just ask that you pray during this time instead. And if you'd like someone to pray with in the time while we pass out the elements, please come pray with us or the deacons as well. So I'd like to invite the deacons up now to help in passing out communion. We're going to pass out the bread first all at once. Just hold on to it until we all get it, and then I'll lead us in taking it together and reflecting on what Christ has done for us. While they're passing it out, wait on the Lord. Pray the psalm that we heard. Think about what it is that Advent is meant to do in us, what the psalm points us to. If you are frustrated, <laughs> if, if you are lonely this morning, if you came in that way, let the psalm guide you to a different place to end. Let the psalm guide you to the Lord. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread with his disciples. He shared a cup with them, that Passover meal. And he repurposed it and he pointed it to him and he said, and he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup together.
that same night when Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Father, we love the Christmas season. We love the the merriment and the, the toys and the decorating and the stories and the fun. But Lord, we know that the Messiah, Jesus, that this points to, the hurting world that he entered into was as real as the bread and the cup that we just took. And Lord, we thank you that the hope he offers us, the hope that he gives us, the difference it makes in us is as real as the difference, the nutrition, the, the feel, the, the reality of the, the bread and the cup that we just took together. Lord, we remember the sacrifice of Christ for us, his forgiveness, the life that he gives us, Lord, and in some ways we just rejoice that all that was waited for from the prophets, the promises, that it came true in him, that we no longer wait like they wait. Lord, we rejoice in you, and yet we also, we wait on you. We put our hope in Christ even more for the things of this earth, for the prospering of the wicked, for the frustrations, the disappointments that still carry around us. Lord, we thank you for this practice you've given us. We thank you for the chance to recenter on the gospel. We pray that you would help us to recenter on that more through this Advent season. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have one more. <coughs> Excuse me. We have uh, one more song we'd like to invite you to stand and uh, respond and. and singing to what it is that Christ has done and seeing the joy that he's brought into the world.
to the world for Christ has come. Just a reminder for you guys, we have in the bulletins for you these daily Advent readings so that what you've grown in in Psalm 37 doesn't have to stop today. You can read part of it in the mornings with you and your families and part of it in the evening and continue to wait on the Lord for that. So I'd encourage you to take this with you uh, and it's got those written in there. Um, But don't forget about the decorating too if you have a few minutes for afterwards. So may the Lord bless you this week as you wait on him and as you look around you to the things going on in this world. May you sing joy to the world for the things that Christ has done and all he's coming back to do. Go in peace.